Good afternoon. Hello. Hi, everybody. Well, I've got a joke to start us off. My kids wrote it for me yesterday at the same time they gave me dinosaur socks to wear. What did the dinosaurs say to the model home? <laughs> hey, come on, Tom. You got to tell him you laughed. Um, we decided that we would get together today and have a discussion about will the model home go extinct? Will it go the way of the dinosaur? What do you think? What do you think? Is the model home going to go extinct? All right, let's have a crowd vote. Will the model home go extinct? I think there's no like maybe or something. There's yes or no. Will the model home go extinct? Yes, it will. Look around. There aren't very many votes. All right. Will the model home go extinct? No, it won't. Well, I'm glad I designed this presentation the way I did. <laughs> Not for a very long time. Unless... Unless what? Do you have any things in your imagination that would change your answer? If your answer is no right now, it's not going to go extinct, what would change your mind? What could happen that you would say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, then it would? Technology? Amazon comes in and says, I want to own this whole industry. Okay? Um, I was thinking that these dinosaurs were thinking they rule the place, right? Like you can see the faint image of them. They're having a party in the background. They were studs too. And, um, and along comes a meteorite or a great flood or whatever it was. But their big party was kind of instantly over. And I was thinking, what in our industry would make our um, new model home big party be over? And I thought of some of the answers that you said. Um, this guy is the saber-toothed tiger. Have you ever seen him before? And um, he looks to me like Jeff Bezos. Or Elon Musk. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Sergey Brin. What if one of these guys who were outside of our space came in and did something revolutionary? Then maybe the model home would go a different way. But we're going to proceed today saying, well, that's kind of out of our control and something that we can't get our hands fully around. Let's make better use of our time kind of thinking about what's inside of our circle of control and what may be within our influence. So let's assume that Sabretooth doesn't show up and instead we continue to be the big woolly mammoths that we are. Right? Because this industry moves slow. Have you seen that? Anyone else thinks that this industry moves slower, say, than... Um, how long ago were we putting quarters in machines to make phone calls? And, and then we had a bag with a battery. Yeah? And then we had a smaller one that flipped. The razor was cool. And, um, and it wasn't long until you're doing everything, including your banking, on this phone that didn't exist that way a decade ago, but you were still taking a hammer or a nail gun, and you're doing things the same way. In our industry, things tend to move slowly, I think, because there are many barriers, many constraints. Structurally, our industry is formed in a way where change doesn't happen really fast. Is that right? Generally speaking, in our industry, change doesn't happen very fast. Um, I thought about it in terms of like the United States Constitution where the balance of powers and the things just makes it so that our country doesn't fly over here real fast or over here. Our industry doesn't fly over here real fast or over here, but it is moving, and we're crazy if we think that it's not. But let's ask the real question, because it was easy to get a consensus in here. We don't think model homes are going away. This one might be more interesting. What would you say five years from now, more model homes than today, less model homes than today are the same? Five years from now, more, less, or the same? Five years. Anybody more? More model homes five years from now. I feel like I'm doing an auction. Okay, we got one, two. 
Uh, five years from now, the same. Same relative to whatever's going on in the industry, the same number of model homes. Okay, a few, a few. Okay, five years from now, I believe industry being similar in terms of production and development, I believe there will be less model homes than there are today. Okay, look, giant consensus. Do it again because you got to show your you got to show your friends around you. All of us are in this industry together. I love this industry. I've been in it for almost 20 years, and um, I I would tell you that my company believes that there will be less model homes in five years, and. Um, this is something that you'll like this story if you've never played it. This might be the biggest takeaway from this conversation today. When I was in business school, one of the favorite things for everyone to do was to get together with seven or eight of your friends and to get bottles of wine and play a game called Kill My Business. Has anyone here ever played Kill My Business? Someone. Oh, tonight's going to be awesome. <laughs> tonight's going to be really cool for you. Get your friends together. They've got to be knowledgeable. They've got to know what's going on. Buy them wine and stay at the whole dinner while they try to come up with ways to kill your business. Kill it. Now, for my company that I founded 10 years ago, New Homestar, our entire business is to go be on-site sales teams, dedicated sales teams for builders, and guess where all of our people are? Model homes, we're going to sell $2 billion of new residential construction this year for some people in the room, builders who are in the space. And, um, and when all of my friends at business school were coming up with, how do we kill Dave's business? Their solution was, the model home goes extinct. So this entire presentation is made off of some really smart business owners saying, Dave, if virtual reality and other things come to be in a way at the model home would no longer be relevant, then that would kill your business as it is today. And, um, and here I'm standing and saying, yes, all the data I'm going to present to you now should lead us to a pretty easy conclusion that there will be less model homes five years from now than there are today. And then we'll try to create a little discussion with the group regarding what we can do about it. And so that would be the outcome of this conversation is just to give us enough data to think about, think about it reasonably and say, yes, it might be trending that way. And when you're looking at a piece of land that it would be in the back of your mind that you might not automatically say, I'm going to put four models in a model park. There may be some uh, invention of technology. There may be some other force. I just want to talk through those so that if anything else, when you're out, you've got the virtual reality goggles on, getting all dizzy on the show floor today, um, you can kind of put in perspective what I hope as I think the most powerful crowd the most important crowd to me um, is in this room. I mean, you're all the ones who are running the companies that are pushing the major business in this industry. And so I wanted to be respectful of your time and try to put something in front of you that, that was thought provoking and that we might also together be able to frame it in in a way that would cause us to look forward thinking intelligently about what data is telling us and how we might look at future model home use. Make sense? All right, so let's just jump in and um, and see what we have here. So why will there be less models? And I, I'm, I only came up with five, and I think that we can come up with a few more in the group. Number one, and we've already got a few of these, improved tools will better enable a customer to experience it virtually. Do you believe five years from now that we're going to have better tools than we do today? If you've experienced anything on the show floor in the past couple years, I haven't been out there yet, it's got to get better. right? My son's PlayStation game has technology advanced past where I've experienced us so far, so it's very reasonable to me that an industry this big and this powerful is going to have advanced tools. Does that make sense? Number one, there are going to be better virtual tools five years from now than there are today. Yes? Okay, cool. We're, we're bought in on that. The customer wants to shop and buy virtually and will push or force the issue. We should be able to get some disagreement on this one. They don't want to buy a house virtually, Dave. All right? Come on. Somebody, somebody can say, Dave, that's not going to happen. They're not going to. That's okay. Disagreement. Okay, we got a few. They're not going to do that. I don't care if they grew up with an, with an iPod in their face. They're not going to buy a house without walking it. That's a reasonable thing for us to push back on. We'll look at some data in a second. Um, I think that you, the builder, has motivation. I know you have motivation 
to find more cost-effective and efficient ways than constructing models. Anybody here think that constructing models is a hard part of your business, financing them, carrying them? Anybody, that's, that's something that you're kind of constantly managing and isn't easy. You've got liability out there. I think that there's motivation on, I think there's motivation on your side to have less, and there's motivation on the buyer's side to do it differently, and there's the advent of new technology every day that's going to enable it. I also wonder, and these last two are a little speculative for, to me, but I wonder if things are changing or will change in the industry as virtual tools become more powerful where you might not want to be locked down to a piece of land in a particular model home um, as willingly as you are today. Let your mind drift on that one. Is the day coming where the way that this whole thing works makes you not want to take down 300 lots and pick your three floor plans at the beginning of it and stick with it? Will, will digital assets, virtual reality, augmented reality, make it so that you want to be more flexible about product and place? I have notions in my mind that it might. Whether that happens in five years will be interesting. And then the other thing that I think is real, um, new actors will find inventive ways. If we don't, new actors are going to come in. This industry continues to be, depending on how you measure it, potentially the largest driver of our U.S. economy. And so people have their eyes on it, and if we aren't inventing it, someone else will. Um, here are a couple charts. This data might just help you to be more believing. This shows you the percentage of sales that are moving from traditional to e-commerce. And you see it as a straight line. On the next chart, it shows it to you quarter by quarter. And it's, the, um, it's just straight up and to your right. Do, does anyone in here believe that it's not going to continue in the direction of becoming more and more online, retail in general? How many of you did almost all of your Christmas shopping by way of Amazon this, this year? Okay, how many of you didn't three years ago? Right, like it's trending hard in this direction. It was an interesting thing, it just came out today, it's not in the presentation. Apple just took their retail head who was in their C-circle and pushed that person out of the C-circle. Today the announcement is what I read. Anybody see this? Push them out of the C-circle and push their virtual reality person into the C-circle. Apple is taking their head of retail out of their C-suite. What a sign. Think about that. Apple is taking their head of retail that has been in the C-suite and moving them out in favor of someone who's focused on technological advancements. This is the trend. It doesn't seem to be changing. Um, E-commerce in the United States, as projected, is getting higher and higher and higher. This goes through 2023. And then watch. Um, national online shopping preferences, this matters to you. 67% of millennials want to buy online. Check it out. Right now, you're asking a millennial who can see anything they want on their phone anytime they want to come out to your model home, drive to this one, and then drive to this one. Do you know that we're asking them to play by our rules and do it our way, but that's not how they shop for other things? Yeah, Dave, but this is a, this is a big purchase. This is different. It's a big, oh, never mind. Um, they've got a candy dispenser for cars. They've got a candy dispenser for cars. Have you seen this? Have you seen Carvana? They're going 125% year over year. They're now over $500 million in revenue. And you see these things popping up along the expressway. Some person has gone online and bought a car. Has anyone gotten a car delivered from Carvana? Has anyone in here? Is anyone in here? Um, no? OK. Hopefully you have someone on your team who knows about Carvana. We've got to have people in our circle of decision makers who know what's going on with the huge bulk of buyers that's coming to us all in the form of millennials. Right? 
I mean, the fact that no one in this whole room has bought a car from Carvana, Carvana tells us that we might not have a good representation in our upper ranks of what's going on with that next generation, maybe. I won't judge, but it's a good question for us to consider. You literally go online, buy your car, they put it in their little candy dispenser, you can go and buy it. You bought it before you saw it, and it's a car. How many steps away are we from someone doing that with their house? I have friends here who are home builder partners of ours that sell homes to the military. How often do we sell houses because someone took their phone on FaceTime? Is this right? Very. It's, it's coming. Paradigm shift today, right now. Our buyers over the next five years are not thinking about it the way we're thinking about it. The model home is not the only way. If your buyers are walking into your model home and your salesperson saying, how did you find out about us? You were driving by, great. Let me show you the five floor plans that we offer. Are you kidding? They, they've already been on your website and seen everything. Do you know? And if your website was defunct, they didn't come visit you, most likely. Come on, people. Come on. Like, we got, we got to do this or we go the other way. Do you, know, do you know the other way? Do you know the Toys R Us story? It's a great story. Do you know it? Um, in 1999, they had so many online sales that the Federal Trade Commission actually fined them for not being able to deliver them on time. It was that massive. They were so attractive that Amazon made a deal with Toys R Us to be their exclusive toy provider. They were so attractive. Anybody been reading all the press, the headlines about SoftBank, like how they got hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to invest everywhere you're seeing this? SoftBank invested $60 million in Toys R Us in 2000. Toys R Us got mad because Amazon wanted to sell something other than their toys and said, this isn't what I bargained for. I like things the way they were. Toys R Us took Amazon to court and won. Do you know what they won? Do you want to know? They won the right to no longer sell their toys through Amazon. <laughs> True story. Read it. Don't read it while we're sitting here. I'll feel kind of awkward. Um, read it. True story. And we're sitting here, ah, oh, my buyer's never going to do it that way. But we can't do that. It's, it's changing, and we've got to change with it, right? Like this. This is all we're saying. Sears. This is another story, right? No, we don't want to hear that one. Famous, famous story here. Do you see this one? Um, this is the exact quote. The CEO of Blockbuster in 2008 he said that neither Redbox nor Netflix, not Netflix, um, are even on the radar screen in terms of competitors. And they went bankrupt in 2010, primarily because of Netflix. All right, this isn't like a doom and gloom, let's be negative, it's just a hey, things are changing and they're changing in our industry too, and you all are the leaders who can embrace that change and do something with it. And so we're just going to throw a few ideas out there right after we face, like when we're facing change, there are some problems, there are four things, and we're going to focus on one of these. Sometimes you just can't see it. Sometimes change is really hard to see until some dude in dinosaur socks is up here putting stats and you're like, oh, I kind of see it. Maybe you already saw it. Maybe you're already way ahead of us all. Um, motivation, sometimes you can see it, but you don't want to change. You like the way things are, and you don't want to change because that's what you've been doing, and, and you don't want to do anything different. And, and, and we all get, I get stuck there a lot. We get stuck there. Inspiration. Maybe this is where maybe most of us could find ourselves most often. I can see it, and I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Okay, I get it. I get it. Buyers are shopping differently now. Maybe model homes aren't going to be as plentiful five years from now, but I don't know what to do now. And then lastly, I can see it, want to do something, know what to do, but can't execute. And in today's 
in today's 30 minutes that I'm taking, we certainly can't tackle that one. So we're going to focus on um, inspiration, and we're going, to say, um, we're going to say that I can see it, and I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. We're just going to throw some ideas. They're not all my ideas. They're your ideas, too. And then this session will be wrapped up. Uh, just thinking about the changing, the, 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 the changing buying habits, the data that we looked at, the warning that other companies have given us. We want to be progressive. We want to be change leaders. What can we do together? We'll share some things. Um, first off, have you ever heard this before? It takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. It's called the Red Queen effect because the Red Queen set it to Alice in the looking glass. And sometimes we get so busy running, we have to run so hard just to keep the position that we have that it's very hard, maybe even impossible, to be proactive and look out ahead and lead. So we have this very short time together where we can. I just want to encourage us, like, slow down for a minute, stretch your brain, grab ideas from your neighbor when this is over. What can we do? I know we're all running so fast and so hard, and the industry's still treating us good. We don't have time to look that far ahead, but we have to. Um, what is a good go-forward strategy? This guy is, um, I've had more arguments with this guy than any adult man that I know. His name is uh, David Yaffe, and he's a Max and Dora star professor at Harvard Business School. He's got his PhD from Stanford, and he's world-renowned as a strategist. And um, he and I have argued about everything, but especially business, and I've lost every argument I've ever been in with him. Uh, he's got great books. He's brilliant. I lifted some of his ideas for this because his ideas are better than mine, as I learned in all of our arguments. Um, he said about strategy, when you're facing change like this and you want to develop strategy, that you should follow these principles. Look forward. Good strategy looks forward, and it reasons back. What Professor Yaffe taught me was that rather than trying to go sequentially or in a linear path to see where something would go, that I would actually step back, go fishing, go, um, go boating, go whatever you enjoy doing, step back and try to throw your imagination pretty far out in a way that it's detached from right here, that you would look forward and throw it out and get this defined and then reason back to it. And most of us get caught in the trap of running so fast that any attempt at imagination is really just like an iteration of what we're already doing. And how often do you take time, how often do you take time to really detach from the running and throw it out way out there and imagine and allow yourself to imagine? And when you can do that, then dare to reason back to it, it's a completely different outcome, at least from my own experiences, than when I try to incrementally imagine. And so that's one, strat that's one approach towards strategy. Another is make good strategy makes big bets without betting the company. Someone walks out of here, gets excited about something on the show, on the, on the, on the show floor, and drops a million dollars to get some new virtual reality. If a million dollars is a big bet, but not something that would very much hurt the company or the division, that fits inside the strategy, maybe. But we won't make bets so big that we're betting the company. David said that, David Yaffe, you don't bet the company. You make the biggest bet you can bet without betting the company as we're going through these as we're going through these big changes that are coming to us. This one's hard. Builders are, um, some are, some are inclined to do this really well and others struggle with this in my experience working with builders. He would argue that it's important to build an ecosystem instead of being focused on your own egocentric perspective. Sometimes we think of, um, this, is my, this is my castle and Everyone in it serves me, and it allows me to do what I'm going to do. And this guy actually argued with me that 
competitors coming into my space was a good thing because it lifted up things like trades. It lifted up things like land developers. And so a thing that David would argue and, and does very well, and I argued back and was wrong again, um, is that you actually want to build an ecosystem around your business, meaning that you might invest in trades even if you can't completely control them, that you might invest in the HBA even though it also benefits other companies, that you set time aside for doing things that aren't strictly to your advantage and that if you're in an ecosystem of right players, they do the same. And the lift from all of that together is more than if you only focused on your own thing. It's, to some extent, a version of network effects. It's the reason that, it's the reason that Facebook has won and held on because everybody got into it and one user getting on it makes all the other users enjoy it more. He's suggesting that we try to create network effects inside of our industry so that it lifts us all so that we can take more share from used homes or that we could protect against the saber tooth, that we would help each other and improve our whole ecosystem. Um, and then think strategically, act tactically, because we all have a propensity to do one or the other. Do you know what yours is? Are you more of a tactical person or a strategic person? Most of us don't get to be very balanced. We're over here and then over here by discipline. But to be strategic and not tactical is going to leave us short. Lastly, executes. Um, which one's right for you? Which one are you going to go buy this week? Virtual reality, augmented reality, or mixed reality, which is like a virtual environment combined with the real world. Has anyone seen it? It's so cool. Which one of these is right for you? Here's the answer. Maybe none right now. Maybe none. We'll answer the question of how. How much do you want to be a leader and how much do you value the first mover advantage? First mover advantage is just this. If you go do it first in your market, what is there for you to win? I'm going to argue on this slide that in our space right now, there's not a lot to win as a first mover. You go get the virtual reality first, what do you have that your competitor can't copy the moment they see it working? I don't know. I mean, if you're setting up a social media page, then first mover advantage really matters because once they get on yours, maybe they won't go on anyone else's. But first mover advantage also has disadvantages. The person right behind you can let you spend your money and time, wait to see what works, and then come right behind you. Smart strategy. It's called the free rider effect. Is the technology you would invest in right now going to be the stuff that still works a year from now or two years from now? How many of you feel confident that what we're doing right now is what we're going to do two years from now? You've been out on the show for how many of you feel confident? <coughs> anybody? You saw it? You're like, this is the winner? Has anybody found the winner out there yet? No? <laughs> I, I looked last year high and low and I didn't find it. I have it out this year. Um, and then once you're the incumbent and you've made the investment, you've made the investment in your track, if it's not just right, sometimes you're too deep in to be able to back out. You ever been there with a CRM, with a back-end system, something where you're too deep in and you just can't back out? <laughs> Some of you are like, yes! Ugh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> finally building our own so we can continually change it because we can never get what we want from the others. Um, if you are a first mover, you've got a big investment and it's really hard to back out of that position, but everyone behind you can watch, learn, and maneuver. If you're a big public builder with heavy wallets in here, maybe you should be the first mover because you can win it. Sometimes first mover advantage is that winner takes all, sometimes. For most of us, this isn't the right, this isn't the right move from what I can see in this industry right now. Um, I'm going to talk about three slides here that are going to just bring it home. It's going to bring it home to you and how you could think about your strategy relative to model homes. This first one is kind of a, um, kind of a, a clever way to just get you to think about your situ the situation of your company. Where's your company? It just says this. In the fight between a bear and an alligator, 
the outcome is determined by the terrain. When you think about your strategy, I hope you're thinking about competitive advantages. And what is a competitive advantage for you must be based on the ecosystem or the terrain in which you operate. You know your market. There are markets represented in here that are very difficult for a public to enter. There are markets in here that are very difficult for a small private to be able to compete against the publics. Understand your terrain and pick your fight regarding technology and technological advancement and bets that you will make based on your understanding of your terrain because the winner of this changes in each different terrain. So acknowledging your terrain and where you are should be very much to do. Now this is cool. Two different strategies. Sumo and Judo. Anybody know the difference? Anybody here know any, like, anybody here like a Judo expert before I misspeak? So, come on. Somebody? Somebody? This would be funnier. Anybody in here a sumo expert? How does a sumo wrestler fight? How do they compete? What do they do? I will demonstrate it if necessary, but I hope not. What do they do? They literally use their weight and go straight on. Right? You've just seen this, yeah? If you're a big company in your market, you might be in the right position using sumo strategy to win your market. You're the behemoth. You go define it the way that you want. Opposite, or at least different than that, is judo. Anybody here ever practice judo? A little bit? So I, I, I come at you like a sumo, and you are a judo, Kyle, and what happens? I throw all my weight. Do you try to stop it? No. Judo is perfect. Yes, sir. <laughs> And so understanding who I am in my market, who my company is, as I develop strategy and prepare for this change, and as I make investments, if I had a big public who was going to invest a lot in this way, I'm not going to try to bash up against them with less, with, with less resources. I might have to step and watch that and see where I can maneuver around it. Okay. Um, What do we have as core competencies in this room? Competitive advantages, uh, land positions, construction processes, trade partners, government relations, finance, brand marketing. What stuck out to me is like probably no one in here thinks that you are in the right terrain or the right player to invent the technology that would replace model homes. I feel like that's a big letdown because everybody's like, are we going to get rid of model homes? Uh, probably, probably eventually, but I'm guessing incrementally. And, um, and I'm not advocating anyone here go out here and do something very radical so people are leaving. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, what I will give just in close is a few things that I think do relate to model homes and might be useful for you. So you've got some specific things that you can go back and do. Hope that you're thinking strategically about how to look at the change that's coming. Certainly initiating forward thinking and being proactive in that way, but then very tactically just for the use of us on the way out. Online integration, I'll read these because they're a small font, I apologize. Online integration, comprehensive approach to handling the customer from the beginning to the end. There was marketing and then there was sales and then there was customer service and there is not anymore. The, the, the customer experience starts way upstream and finishes way downstream. And we can't take marketing and say, well, that's this firm's job. And service, and that's this department's job. That, that's not, when you buy something from Amazon, you shop for it there, you read the reviews there, you buy it there, they deliver it to your door. If you don't like it, they pick it up. You give a star rating. We can't be so disjointed. We have to look at from the moment that customer interacts with our brand in the very earliest place, every executive in this room has to feel ownership over that experience 
the same way as you get excited for them walking up to your model home. Because I've been with many of you, and I see how you get if there's a single weed in the landscape bed. But then we'll go to a website, and it's got the wrong phone number on it. That is your experience to own and control all the way upstream. It's online integration. Online contracts. Do I have anybody here? I'm looking for a particular person who's supposed to be here. Do we have anyone here who um, is doing online contracts right now? Not DocuSign, online contracts. Um, they're coming. I've got a client right now who does exclusively online co contracts. We'll do thousands of them this year. A home builder, a big home builder. Exclusively online contracts. Do you know that it's weird for a millennial to come sit across a desk and have you print something off? When was the last time you all bought something sitting across a desk like you were at the principal's office with someone printing something off that had all this mean talk in it? When did you do it? The last big forms that I signed, I scrolled through real quick and pushed accept. And we're still making people at this peak of emotion. No, 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 sit down. I got to print this off. Oh, no, the printer's jammed. <laughs> Did you bring your checkbook? <laughs> um, we're still doing this everywhere. We are. And they're like, I don't know why they keep renting. <laughs> Because their rental has a nice pool and a barbecue, and they did it on their phone. <laughs> we're mad at them. People, we're mad at them. Online contracts, just check it out for goodness sakes. It's a crazy concept. Um, advanced customer focus. Are you researching your buyers so that you can test your assumptions? Are you? Are you researching your buyers so you can test your assumptions? Are you researching your non-buyers so that you can test your assumptions? In today's marketplace, the consumer wins. And if we keep an egocentric approach where we just do what we want to do and they're expected to accommodate us, I think it's a, I think it's a blockbuster type approach. We should be talking to our buyers in a meaningful way and our non-buyers in a meaningful way. And the person who's doing that learning should have influence over what we're doing with strategy on product and positioning and pricing. There should be advanced customer focus from the top of the company because that's the era we're in. Um, Virtual and AR assets, there's stuff out there right now we should be using. And then off-site sales centers. Anybody using off-site sales centers in a progressive way? I know that someone in here has like the Scooby van and you're doing it because your grand opening doesn't have anything there yet. So, but is anyone doing something where you have like corridor, you have a corridor of four or five neighborhoods and you put a virtual sales center or something like that? Anybody? Okay. We, we're... Um, we have, we have thought and um, are looking, we're looking at design. We've already designed, but we're looking at some concepts. This is definitely more than we'll do, but we're thinking about can we take, if we have an exit where we've got six or seven neighborhoods, could we create a, a sales center that would be more friendly to customers, meet them where they're already going, and use virtual assets that would allow them to engage with us rather than driving to all eight neighborhoods, would they be able to go into? And so I'm, I'm kind of throwing that in there as a tease at the end um, with the primary purpose of motivating us as an industry that this industry has been incredibly good to me. Um, what, what, what this has done for my family is uh, I'm blessed beyond what I ever thought. And so I, I get up here. I'm not a speaker. I'm, a, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and a president of a company. But I get up here and I try to share something to just get us, get us to do something a little bit more so we can all win together. All right? Like I'm, just, I'm, I'm throwing stuff up here that I hope causes you to do something or think about something or do something differently so that you can win and we can win because what we're doing is a really important thing, you know? Like what we're doing, providing homes for people and creating neighborhoods is, 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 is totally valiant. And I want us to keep winning. And I know that to do that, we're going to have to keep taking steps forward. And we can't become complacent 
We have to challenge what has happened and see the trends that are happening and think ahead. And so this is our version of that. And we're excited. We're excited to be bold, but we're not going to make bets so big that we bet the whole business. And that's kind of our approach. Um, that's all that I have. I'm thankful for your time. I know that it's very valuable. Uh, and I'll be around for anyone who wants to discuss your ideas or dreams or visions about what comes next or how we're going to eliminate model homes. That'd be my pleasure. My name's Dave Rice with New Home Star, and I thank you very much for being here.